What is up, YouTube? So in the last few months, I have gotten a ton of questions from students and pharmacists about getting into the pharmacy informatics field. Now what's interesting is the common denominator among all of those questions were how do I get into the pharmacy informatics field without a pharmacy residency? So the purpose of this video is to provide a roadmap and some recommendations on how do you get into and slide right into this pharmacy informatics field without doing a pharmacy residency. All right, so before I start, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on the job market of pharmacy informatics. I think it's very useful to understand and know this information before stepping into this field. First off, there is a lack of informatics trained pharmacists out there. And to back that up, the first publication of the pharmacy forecast back in 2013, which is basically the survey of where the pharmacy profession's headed and all of that jazz, basically said that there's a lack of informatics trained pharmacists out there. Uh, so that's one. And the other thing is the concept of you need a residency to do anything in pharmacy nowadays. Definitely not true. Um, I'm a little biased. I'd recommend it for a couple of reasons, which I can talk about in another video. But you definitely don't need a pharmacy residency for everything. It's an investment in time, it's an investment in money, um, and it depends on the field too. Pharmacy informatics, to give you an idea of residency training, when I graduated from my PGY2 in pharmacy informatics, and this was only two years ago, there were only 16 PGY2s in pharmacy informatics. Think about that, 16. So there's only 16 individuals coming out with that kind of training. That's not a lot. The other thing is, of those 16, only eight of them were accredited by ASHP. And to even further add to that, not every one of those positions were always filled. The first informatics residency, or the first PGY2 in informatics, actually came out in 2006. So this field is very new, and thinking about simple, basic economics, the demand is extremely high, and the supply is extremely low. So what does that mean? Not many places uh, even can get a residency trained informatics pharmacist. The thing is, they needed informatics pharmacists to do many of the workflows and build and things that they want to do nowadays with the advent of all these electronic health systems. So that's why you're in a great place if you're trying to get into informatics. You definitely don't need a residency, but there are some things that I would recommend because this field is starting to get noticed and more people are getting into it. You definitely want to have some tips or advice on how you can set yourself apart from everyone else trying to get into this field. This, this topic of getting into pharmacy informatics has actually been a hot topic of some sorts. It's definitely being asked by a lot more students now than many years ago. And one of my colleagues, Anuj, actually published a career pathway about this in 2015 to highlight what are the paths I can take to get into pharmacy informatics. It's published online in one of the blogs for ASHP. He highlights four pathways. I'm going to briefly touch on them to give you all an idea. But what he didn't really touch on was how do you get there from a student and how do you get there coming from retail. So I'm going to briefly touch on that and give you some recommendations on how you can do that. There are four pathways that he recommends. The first one is getting to pharmacy informatics as a staff pharmacist or a clinical pharmacist. So you're already working in the hospital, how do you get there? In many cases, people get into an informatics position from a staff or clinical pharmacist because their hospital is implementing a new electronic health record like Epic or Cerner, something of that sort, and they need people to jump on board and help them with the team. Their team might be expanding and they're just looking to hire someone. So that's a very common pathway. And as Anuj points out, this is where we actually saw a lot of the first pharmacy informatics folks get into their positions they are in today. They just, yeah, I'm interested, jump into it. And what we saw, and what I personally saw, is that people that did it this way quickly rose up the ranks because there's no one that was interested, no one that knew about these fields and they just kept constantly rising and many of these people are pharmacy informatics managers, supervisors, directors, and some of them are even in the C-suite. So this approach, typically if you're working in the hospitals, you have, one of the pros about this is that you have great knowledge of pharmacy workflows. One of the cons to this is it really depends on the availability. So it's right time, right place. Uh, the, second, the second pathway is individuals that have a professional 
or formal training in informatics or in something IT. So these are individuals that have a bachelor's in like computer science, computer engineering, some type of technical background, and then they go to pharmacy school, and then they go into pharmacy informatics. So I haven't seen too many people in this field. Most of the times I see people who have an interest in informally in informatics, uh, may have interest in computer engineering, computer programming, something of that sort, and then they get into it. I do know of one, one of my colleagues actually, was in her prior life, I believe she was a computer programmer, uh, and she went to pharmacy school, did a residency, and is actually working with me right now. She has an extraordinary amount of technical skills because of her previous profession, uh, which is one of the pros to this approach. I don't know how many of my viewers out there actually are in this bucket. One of the drawbacks that Anuj mentioned with this pathway is that you might not understand as much of the pharmacy and clinical workflows as one who didn't pursue this pathway really depends on your student experiences, your rotations, and things of that sort. Now the third pathway is what some people are now considering almost like the formal approach where you go to pharmacy school, you do a PGY-1 in pharmacy practice, and then you do a PGY-2 in pharmacy informatics. That's the pathway I took. The pros to that is many people recognize that pathway. Um, it sets you apart from a lot of individuals that you think about. It. There are only 16 Pharmacy Informatics PGY2s only two years ago. So doing one of them makes you a handful. I don't even know if there's a hundred folks out there right now that have a PGY2 in Pharmacy Informatics. So you are really in your a very unique bucket of individuals that pursue that route. The downside, of course, is it's a huge time commitment, a huge financial consideration, a lot of things to consider for there. So I'm not really going to talk about that much since this video was meant for the non-residency pursuing folks. The last path that Anuj mentioned is people who go to pharmacy school and then go on to do more formal training. So these are, these are people who do a master's later, like master's in healthcare informatics or a PhD in informatics, things of that sort. People who go this route typically go into academia, uh, they're more teaching or research involved. The downsides of this is kind of that, you know, it's just more schooling after pharmacy school, but it's another pathway. So the pathways that were not mentioned and I want to kind of highlight is the student to pharmacy informatics and the retail to pharmacy informatics and the hospital slash ambulatory type pharmacist into informatics. Now, if you're in one of those buckets, there are four main things you can do to set yourself apart from everyone else. The first thing is to ensure that your clinical skills are solid. One of the best approaches to this is obtaining something that is noticeable you can put on your resume and show others that you are clinically competent. And that is through board certification like BCPS. Uh, if you're unsure about what BCPS is or things of that sort, I have a video that I'll post somewhere in here uh, highlighting my experience and I'll post some links in the description if you're interested in looking more into board certification. There's a lot of different certifications you can have. BCPS is the most common and this is I'm recommending that as a way to certify your clinical competence because it's in my opinion probably the most widely recognized clinical certification you can obtain as a pharmacist. I also say that it's important to have others recognize your clinical competence you don't have to get BCPS, but in some way, because when I was interviewing for positions and looking for informatics positions, and keep in mind that I was coming out of a PGY2 in pharmacy informatics, that the number one question I got from managers, recruiters, uh, and directors was, what is your clinical competence? What were your staffing experience? What were your clinical skills? What did you do as a pharmacist? Not as an informatics pharmacist, but as a pharmacist. Think about it, right? We design the tools that the clinical pharmacists use. So it's important to have that mindset and keep that mindset and retain that mindset as you go. The second approach here is to get some type of informatics training. Uh, this is probably the bulk of what I'm gonna talk about today. This is great because you can talk about this while you're networking, you can talk about this when you're interviewing, you can put a lot of these experiences on your resume or CV. So the first thing, probably one of the easiest, informally, is to pick up projects. 
wherever your job location would be. If you're in retail, if you're in hospital, if you're a student, it does not matter. If you see a project of any kind, pick it up. Or whether it's like creating a new workflow for how techs refill a, a robot at your community pharmacy, whether it is uh, organizing students for a community event, uh, whether it's organizing or managing or developing a staffing calendar, doesn't matter. Any one of these projects will probably require you to do some type of project management. And that's important because project management skills, task management, priorities, those kind of skills are needed in an informatics profession. So that's very helpful. Not only that, when you're doing these type of projects, you usually end up doing work in Excel, PowerPoint, you're doing presentations, and sometimes you do a little bit of technical stuff. So you gain proficiency in using those kind of things, and it's very helpful, and you can talk about it again on your interviews and put it on your resume and CV. The other thing you can do kind of informally and formally is volunteering. I think this is one of the easiest ways to get in as well. There's a lot of organizations in which you can become members and participate in various work groups. Uh, for example, I am, a I am in one of ASHP's section advisory groups. Uh, specifically the one for pharmacy informatics and technology. You, of course you have to be a member to participate, but it's free to participate. You just sign up. I don't know of anyone that's got rejected, but it's great resume CV recognition. You put that you're part of this collaborative section advisory group and you talk about and work together on various projects in the pharmacy informatics community. One of the projects I'm working on right now is we're writing an article that will be published on AJHP on the knowledge, education, and skill sets of the pharmacy informatics leader. So it is great opportunities, great recognition, and great networking. If you are interested in that, I'll definitely post a link in the description below so you can find out more information about how you can do that and participate. It's usually a one-year commitment. The sign-up deadlines are usually April of each year. Now, some of the other things you can do formally is getting certifications in informatics. So there's a couple of them out there. I'll highlight the ones that I would recommend. The first one is the one from HIMS. Uh, you may have heard of it. It's CP HIMS or CA HIMS. The main difference is informatics experience. CA HIMS typically doesn't require any experience. Some students get it. Uh, people who are new to informatics get it. So even if you're working at retail or in a hospital, it's a great certification to have. It shows that you, you gain some fundamental skills in informatics, so it's very excellent, and it's probably one of the most widely recognized informatics certification out there, to my experience. CP HIMS is for the ones who typically have three years plus of informatics experience. This is probably not for the viewers out there. CA HIMS is where you want to go uh, to get that intro to informatics certification. Again, it's very widely recognized. Another thing that's not widely recognized, but the organization giving the certification is, is the Pharmacy Informatics Certification from ASHP. It's very, very new. I think it's uh, two or three years old. It's not, not, that, not that old, but the thing is, ASHP is very widely recognized, so having this can help with that. And it's about, I believe, $400. What's nice about this is you get formal recognition of having a pharmacy informatics certificate but not only that you get a ton of CE so if you need to do CE here's a great way where you can get your CE get a formal certificate and get your informatics training the last certification I'll talk about is the one from AMIA this one's actually been in the works for a while now they've been talking about it for a while uh, and most recently I think it was last year they started drafting the prereqs and what they what this certificate's gonna look like. It's actually the one I'm holding out for because the niche for this certification are really, really is for the ones who wanna practice clinical informatics. One, a lot of the commentary that I hear about the ones from HIMSS is that it's a bit too technical. Now, it's just word of mouth is what I'm hearing, but not bad at all. I think those are important skills to have. Um, I'm personally just very interested in more of the clinical informatics side and AMIA is the certification that I'll probably end up getting. Hopefully we're gonna see that in the next year or two when that comes out. Now, to take that a step further from certifications, if you really are invested in informatics, you truly know this is the field you wanna live, breathe in every day, props to you. But if you are one of those individuals, master's degree is another way you can go. 
Masters of Healthcare Informatics. I mention this because in my experience as I progress through my pharmacy career, what I've noticed so far is that typically if you're someone pursuing a Masters in Healthcare Informatics and your institution is implementing electronic health record uh, or doing anything informatics related and they're looking to hire, you're one of the first individuals they look to in terms of hiring in. Personally, uh, I've been torn about pursuing a MBA versus MHA versus MPH versus MHI. I actually, if you've, if you've ever been following my videos, I'm actually pursuing an MPH. I'm going to discuss my reasons and rationale for pursuing that at another video, but that's something to consider. And of course, lastly, in terms of formal training, you can always do the residency training uh, if that is the way you want to go, but I'm not really going to talk about that. That will also be another video in the future. And so the third recommendation I have is networking. I can't ever give any advice without talking about networking, especially if you're trying to get into the informatics field without a residency training. I really think that networking opens up a lot of doors that wouldn't potentially be there if you didn't network. And in my opinion, I'm a little biased, but I think the best place to do this kind of networking is actually at ASHP's mid-year in December of every year. There are a ton of informatics networking sessions there, and literally, you can walk in, attend one of those networking sessions, and meet the pharmacy informatics leaders from across the world. I mean, it's, it's just awesome. You meet all these leaders out there, and it's a great networking experience and could potentially land you into a job or other opportunities or just say you met some cool big wig something like that otherwise network anywhere you can go uh, student talk to upperclassmen uh, talk to pharmacy students ahead of you talk to students in residencies talk to people on rotations talk to them meet them meet the managers meet the directors network with them ask about informatics opportunities ask to meet the informatics pharmacists those hospitals talk to them and just you never know sometimes opportunities open up say you're interested and you know right time right place it'll get you where you need to go the, the last thing I'll say about this is that you can obviously make a bad impression so don't just like show up and be dumb about it you know you know learn a little bit about networking what it entails and network properly talk to some of your friends and colleagues that are a little bit more extroverted uh, who are good at networking. Just get some of their advice on how best to network and some of the etiquette possibly. And I think that because that's such an important topic, I'll probably make a video about it on how I approach interviewing. I've been on both sides now in many different situations. Figured I'd share some of my experience. And hopefully I can help you all on some of that. The last recommendation is kind of obvious, but it's just basically start applying. And the reason why I say that is because there are so many opportunities in this world and it's Literally sometimes about the right time, right place. That is it. From what I've learned is that the qualifications and uh, experiences and competencies that they mention in those job descriptions is a bunch of BS. They overinflate it, in my opinion, to deter a lot of less confident but competent individuals from applying. So if you're one of those folks, you know, just apply. You need 10 years of experience? Just apply. You don't have any experience? Just apply doesn't matter. I just think that you should apply. It's like that cliche quote out there about um, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. I think it's true. Sometimes people apply for a position and they get an interview. You know, why not try? It doesn't hurt. So I definitely think you should just start applying. All right guys, so that's the end of the video. Hopefully that helps. I'll be posting some more information in the description, the various things you can check out, the things that I've talked about in this video. But otherwise, I hope this was helpful. Keep the comments coming. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that I would encourage you all to leave comments in the videos below. I don't know why. For some reason, everyone likes to message me directly, which is great. I love interacting with you all. I think I just get a little backlog sometimes. There's so many things going on in my personal life and my work life that sometimes I don't get to them right away. And I think that video is the best way for me to scale my input and opinions and comments and share it with you all. So definitely use the comment section below to ask me questions so we can help everyone out. All right, until next time, guys.